Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. First up, let's begin with four brief but important updates related to U.S.-China relations. First. On Monday, senior U.S. and Chinese officials held talks in Beijing, talks which both sides described as candid and productive in their respective official readouts. Daniel Crittenbrick, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, met with PRC Vice Foreign Minister Ma Jiaoxu, the U.S. National Security Council's Senior Director for China and Taiwan Affairs, as well as U.S. Ambassador Burns, were also present at the meeting. Second. There are widespread, but as of recording, currently unconfirmed reports in U.S. media that the U.S. and China have agreed to reschedule U.S. Secretary of State Blinken's trip to Beijing. Indeed, this may have been negotiated in the Monday talks we just covered. We remember that Blinken had originally been scheduled to travel to the PRC earlier this year. But cancelled due to the surveillance balloon saga at the time. If the trip goes ahead, it would be the first Secretary of State visit to China since the early Trump administration. Third, in an interview with Fareed Zakaria a few days ago, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan provided the first definition from a senior U.S. official of what exactly de-risking in relation to its China policy is versus decoupling. This was the statement: "Quote, we are not looking to end trade between the United States and China, but we are looking to de-risk. What does that mean? I mean, it's three things. First, it means that we need to secure resilient supply chains in critical goods like clean energy technologies and semiconductors, so that we're not reliant on any one country. Second, it means we need to protect our most advanced technologies, especially those with military applications, so those technologies cannot be used to harm our national security. And third, it means we need to fundamentally invest in the sources of our own industrial capacity here at home, so that we have the ability to grow and produce some of the critical goods that we are going to need to rely on in the years ahead, whether that's in the field of technology or health or clean energy, and that is what we intend to do, not to decouple. In quote. In fourth. Yesterday, Tuesday, the U.S. imposed sanctions on more than a dozen people and entities in mainland China, Hong Kong, and Iran, over accusations that they were involved in procuring parts and technology for key actors in Iran's ballistic missile development. Next up, yesterday, Tuesday, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government announced that its Department of Justice applied to the city's High Court for an injunction banning the broadcasting or dissemination, including on the internet and any media accessible online, of the song "Glory to Hong Kong." Glory to Hong Kong is a protest song composed during the 2019-2020 Hong Kong protests. Some have referred to it as a so-called national anthem for an independent Hong Kong. Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee has described the song as quote, "closely connected to the 2019 violence and disturbances, and advocacy for Hong Kong's independence." End quote. Following the enactment of the so-called Hong Kong National Security Law in 2020, the Hong Kong government deemed the song separatist and subversive. Indeed, this position is made clear in the injunction order application itself, which expresses quote, "The injunction is to restrain anyone from disseminating or performing, etc." The song, with the intention of inciting others to commit secession or with a seditious intent. End quote. A Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government spokesperson told reporters yesterday, quote, "The application pursues the legitimate aim of safeguarding national security, and is necessary, reasonable, legitimate, and consistent with the Bill of Rights." End quote. If the application is successful and the court grants this injunction order. Google, Facebook, and other internet platforms may have to choose between complying and censoring the song or shutting down their Hong Kong services. Commentators also question whether an order would require local blocking of the song or a global removal on these platforms. 
If it's the latter, then it is hard to believe that Google, Facebook and others would comply, as the political fallout in Washington and other democratic capitals would likely be significant. While this development will likely be very disquieting to many in the liberal democratic world, in the Chinese mainland it has been presented as a matter of national security and dignity. Quote, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government has now conveyed a clear message. Any distribution or promulgation of the song will be a criminal offence. This is an essential act to restore and secure the dignity of the national anthem and to safeguard national security. End quote. Next up, a deeply concerning new report on the Chinese economy. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. Sharing and subscribing is a huge help as well. It's only me making these episodes every day. It's a lot of work, but your guys' support is a huge source of motivation. So thank you very much. As always, anyone who can go that extra mile and help keep the channel sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. There is also the super thanks function in YouTube itself. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Finally, for today's video, we continue our ongoing coverage of the local government fiscal and debt crisis, which has, in recent months, transformed into a national debate within financial and policymaking circles. US-based Rhodium Group, which has traditionally published excellent analysis on China's financial system, has just produced a new report on this very subject. The report, which is titled Tapped Out, was authored by Alan Fung, Associate Director with Rodian Group's China Markets Research Team, as well as Logan Wright, Rodian Group partner and leader of the firm's China Markets Research work. Quote, The 2022 annual results of 2,892 local government financing vehicles reveal a rare decline in overall cash positions relative to rising interest costs and debt levels. The current weakness of localities' finances prevents Beijing from utilizing fiscal policy to support the economy. In fact, this is the primary reason why there has been no meaningful fiscal support for China's recovery this year. Recent public calls for help from Guiyang, provincial capital of Guizhou, and Hohot, provincial capital of Inner Mongolia, reflect widespread local government financing distress. These pleas should multiply in short order, increasing pressure on Beijing to promptly address the mounting debt crisis before it becomes irreversible. The critical question after a probable large-scale local debt restructuring is what role local investment will continue to play in the future of China's economy. End quote. The authors continue by arguing that the possibility of defaults on local government financing vehicle bonds will act as an amplifier of the debt crisis which would require an immediate response from Beijing. Quote, The nature of the debt problem is well understood at this point. Local government financing vehicles alone hold 59 trillion yuan in interest-paying debt and payables, around 50% of GDP. End quote. Other explicit and implicit local debts through schools, hospitals, and other institutions may bring the total closer to 100% of GDP. Quote, but the scope and implications of the local debt crisis are much wider and larger than conventional wisdom suggests. End quote. The authors continue by pointing out that discussions around the problems of local government financing vehicles are over a decade old, precisely because local government financing vehicles have played such an important role in China's growth model throughout the past decade. Restructuring local debt, or quote-unquote solving the local government debt problem, would change China's entire economy. Quote, any meaningful resolution of the debt problem would likely trigger significant structural slowdown in investment and a sharp slowdown in economic growth for the next decade. End quote. The report also discusses the critical role of land use sales in local fiscal conditions, demonstrating, as we on China Update have been following for years now, the critical link between the housing crisis and the local fiscal crisis, both part of a wider systemic challenge facing policy makers. The report writes, One of the most significant consequences of the property market's two-year rout for localities was the decline in land sales revenues, which were 2 trillion yuan lower in 2022 than the previous year, and will decline further this year, given payments on land purchases were made with a one-year lag. As private developers have withdrawn from the market and state-owned developers slash their land purchases, 
local governments have suffered to create an illusion of prosperity in the land market and attract buyers, as well as to artificially inflate land sales revenues, local governments tasked local government financing vehicles to buy considerable volumes of land last year. We remember that last November the Finance Ministry had to issue a statement instructing local governments to stop using local government financing vehicles to artificially inflate land transaction numbers. Quote, but this barely worked. Local government financing vehicles accounted for half of land purchases in 2022, compared to 33% in 2021 and 17% in 2020. End quote. The report then concludes, making points which should all be familiar to regular China Update viewers. Quote, the most important variables impacting China's economic growth over the next two years will be the success or failure of local government debt restructuring and Beijing's approach to the role of local government investment within China's economy in the future. The current course, which China has used as an intrinsic element in its growth model over the past two decades, has reached its terminus, with more and more localities likely to follow the path of Guiyang and Hohot in requesting bailouts. A collapse in local government investment would be comparable to the economic impacts of the crisis in the property market. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Have a wonderful Wednesday wherever you are, and I will see you all tomorrow.